and we will work with you from there. If you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'll be taking my text from verse 1. I want to use for a title, Callings and Servanthood. Callings and Servanthood. When you found the passage, would you stand please for the reading of God's Word? Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now turn please to chapter 4 of Romans and look at verse number 17. Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, as it is written... I have made thee a father of many nations before him who believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would stand beside us, that you would help us, that you would transmit through me this morning your word, that the Holy Spirit would cause it, O Lord, to quicken our hearts to awaken our minds and souls that we may comprehend the realities that is found in our passages today. We ask it all in the lovely name of Jesus, amen and amen. You may be seated. Donald Barnhouse, in his commentary on Romans, likened his exposition of Romans to a farmer plowing a field, writing, we may put in the plow at the very first verse, and began to go down the furrows until the whole field has been turned over once. But there will be need of further harrowing and cultivating by the individual student. And that's what we're doing in our sermons this morning and last Sunday. We're strictly trying to turn over some of the sod in Romans. You will have to go through it and pick it out for yourself and Chop it up for yourself. If you, if you don't do that, you're going to miss a lot of things that is important in these passages. Last Sunday, we explored the idea of servanthood, and we discovered that mankind is born to serve. We used the term, the universal perpetual servanthood of humankind. That is the doctrine that all men serve something or someone. Nobody is our own man or own woman. We are servants, either to God or to Satan. We have not the luxury of rejecting servanthood, but we do have the ability to choose our master. In this sermon, I want to continue that theme, the theme that believers are simply humans who have exercised their rights and have chosen Christ as their master. When we have done so, when we have chosen Christ as our master, we have entered into the same state as that of Paul in our text, and we could now introduce ourselves as so-and-so a servant of Jesus Christ. In our text, we move to examine the second step in the vocation of servanthood, and it is found and encapsulated in the word found in Romans 1 and 1. That word is called. We hear a lot about callings today, but I really wonder how many understand that they have a calling and should be functioning in that calling. When we say callings today, people think about ministers or missionaries or some such, and that is callings. But every saint of God has been called to serve in some capacity. What I want to first leave with you today is that A calling is not emancipation. So often believers mistake calling for emancipation or release from servanthood. We see ministers who have built religious empires for themselves and are now using their their calling to acquire wealth, fame, and power. And they do whatever they want to with impunity because they believe that because they were called of God into the ministry, It has given them emancipation. 
They can be their own boss. They can do what they want to do. Ladies and gentlemen, the calling of God is never emancipation. We see lay people who are called to lead. Maybe they're called to lead believers in worship. And some of them takes that calling as emancipation and they regularly prostitute it for their own glory or profit. But the word calling follows the word servant in our text for a reason. And that reason is that a calling is not a release from servanthood. Rather, a calling is simply a servant who is given a specific task to which the master wants him to devote all of his energies and efforts. Eleazar, the servant of Abraham, in Genesis chapter 24, was sent by his master to select a wife for Isaac. That was his calling in Genesis 24. But that calling or specific task did not emancipate Eliezer from servanthood. He couldn't just go pick any girl he wanted. It had to be picked within the confines of his master's preferences. And that calling did not make Eliezer a free man. He was still beholden to his master. He still had a duty. He still had an authority figure to report to. This servant, the Bible tells us in another passage, was over all the other servants of Abraham. But even that did not make him the free man to do as he wished. The apostles of Christ were all called to the specific task of preaching the gospel. They knew their assignment and they refused to take on any other task, no matter how good or right, if it interfered with their ability to do what they had been called to do. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 2, when there arose the disputations about the, widow, the widows being ministered to, the apostles said, search out somebody and let them be set over that, but we will dedicate ourselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer because they understood that what that is was what God had called them to do and they could not forsake that calling for anything else because they were servants. God may place us, God may place upon us any responsibility, office, or task that he wishes. But no matter how lofty or important it may seem or how minuscule and unimportant it may seem, it does not ever mean that we are emancipated. We are still servants. The head servant may be over all the other servants, but he himself remains a servant still. This idea is ingrained in the Greek word for called in our text, which is kletos. And it means called or summoned. It is used in the sense that someone's participation or presence has been officially requested and refusal to appear or participate is not an option. The idea, ladies and gentlemen, that refusal cannot be an option will only mean one thing, and that is that the person summoned was not a free man. A free man may choose not to go or not to participate. A servant may not. The believer's calling does not emancipate him or make him his own man or her her own woman. We remain the servants of Jesus Christ, but we have been called to to focus all of our efforts, energies, and talents to a specialized area of service to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, these are two of the scriptures that give specific callings to which God may summon believers. And when God summons believers, they must answer the call. But we must always guard against the tendency to prostitute that calling. We must always remember we are servants still. As I said last Sunday morning, we don't have a life outside of Jesus Christ. We don't have goals outside of the goals that he has set for us. We are servants. We must not labor solely out of love for the calling, but we must labor out of love for the one who has called us. This truth, truth means that at times 
You and I may be assigned a task which we do not want or for which we do not feel prepared. But that doesn't matter at all. We are servants. It is our duty to commit ourselves totally to the task given to us by our master. The thing about the callings which God lays upon us is that no matter how we might dread them or how great our inadequacies at first seems to be, when we commit ourselves to the task, we find in them more fulfillment than we would ever find in any other duty in any other world. I would remind you also that not only is callings not emancipation, but callings are not conferments. Sometimes in this world, upon certain persons, is conferred a title or an honorary degree. This simply is the conferring of a title upon a person of whom nothing was required as a condition to receive it. This means that the title or the honorary degree is given in name only. No work was required to receive the title or the degree. No work is required to retain such a title or degree. But could I tell you that the callings of God are not conferments? God does not bestow titles, degrees, knighthood, or sainthood upon people with no expectations. The callings of God upon believers are for specific purposes, all of which contribute to the glory of God and the fulfillment of His purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say to you that if you are focusing or functioning in any calling of God. It is not enough to have just been called. Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There is a great deal of work that is required to function in a calling that God has given you effectively. And it doesn't matter how much you are anointed. If you don't prepare yourself for that calling, you are not going to be effective in the work of the Lord. If you are called to sing, you should still be trying to improve your talents. If you are called to play an instrument, you should still be learning how to play and master that instrument. If you're called to preach, for God's sake, study. Don't get up here and say something that just fills a space or time. Or don't fill your sermons with so many amens, glory to gods, and hallelujahs that we can't even remember what the text was about. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Have something to say and know how to say it. And for God's sake, do it to the best of your ability. No matter how much you pray, no matter how much you are anointed, God expects something of us. He expects us to prepare ourselves. I believe the children of God should be the most knowledgeable and learned people on the planet. Why? Because we never know what God wants us to do. He might call us to something for which we have no knowledge. It is important that we learn everything we can learn and become proficient at everything we can become proficient of because we don't know what God may call upon us to do tomorrow. Prophets must prophesy. Ministers must minister. Apostles must be messengers. Prayer warriors must wage war on their knees. Titles and assignments do nothing by themselves. The called must act in their calling in obedience to the commands of their master, Jesus Christ. I have told you that callings are not emancipation. Callings are not conferments. I want to spend the next two points telling you what callings are. Callings are commands. They are assignments of masters to servants. And those assignments of masters to servants have never in the history of the world been understood as suggestions. All assignments given by a master to a servant has always been considered a demand. It was expected that the servant would tend to the responsibilities assigned him. Even the master's preferences were considered binding upon the servant. Believers, we fail and violate the responsibility of our servanthood when we treat any calling or assignment from God to us as a suggestion or a non-binding preference. 
The assignments of all believers, such as the Great Commission, Mark 16 and 15, and the command to let our light shine, Matthew 5 and 16. These two are commands to every believer who, have, who has ever been washed in the blood of Jesus. You don't have to wait for God to come down in the middle of the night and talk to you like he did Solomon and say, go into all the world and preach the gospel or let your light shine so that I can get glory. That is an understood calling when you are born into the family of God. And these callings, these duties, our commands, Whatever Christ must call us to is in addition to these callings. But could I tell you that additional callings, no matter how many they may be, they in no way supersede these first and primary callings. And no calling is a suggestion or a preference for us. We are servants. These are directives from our master. His will must be done. How can we for one minute even contemplate neglecting or not performing these assignments? Callings are commands. I would further tell you that callings are invitations. Callings are invitations issued by the master for the servant to join him in his work and purposes. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. It is the prerogative of God to invite mankind to assist him in his work. Could I tell you that God always goes forward. God is always on the move. God is relentless in progressive motion. People may tire. Saints become complacent. Churches will stall. Religious movements will become distracted. But God marches on toward the fulfillment of his purposes and the callings that he issues to the saints are invitations to walk and work with him. These callings are not only invitations for us to be a part of the master's official business, but they are invitations to spiritual growth and development. We are never called. We are never called. I should say no one has ever been called because they are perfect. No one has ever been called because they were even the best person for the task. We are called because for reasons known only to God, He delights in offering us an invitation to growth and partnership. This is something the saints have forgotten all about. They have become disillusioned and confused about what their role is in the church of the living God. Some will not do anything. They think they have been emancipated. Others want to do their own thing. They too think they have been emancipated. But the callings that God gives to the saints is for the purpose of building that saint, maturing that saint. What's this? 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul talks about the office of a deacon and he says this. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree. Does anybody know what a degree is? It is something that you earn by learning. Something you earn by experience. He said the person that wants to serve as a deacon, if he does it well, he will earn to himself a good degree. And not only that, but he will earn great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now believe me, there's not many deacons across our land that knows this. I have had deacons in churches that I have pastored that thought they were there to keep me straight. I've had deacons that thought they were there to lord it over the church and make them do what they wanted to do. But the Bible says they're there to mature, to grow, to learn through a daily working and administration, just like the preacher is. We're all growing here. None of us is perfect. None of us has reached it. None of us has attained. But God gives us the chance to grow through our working with Him. 
And it's true even if you're not a deacon. If you're not a singer, if you're not a minister, the callings that God has called you and invited you to function in is ability for you to grow and mature. And when you half-heartedly engage in those or choose not to engage at all, you are being content to stay in the immature state that you currently are in. In 1 Corinthians, I, I want to show you this because there's so many scriptures that teach this truth. And I, I would risk boring you if I attempted to include them all. But let me show you a couple of more. I want to show you that we are not called because we are the best for the job or the most perfect, perfect believer or because of any other positive attribute that we possess. In fact, Paul almost seems to suggest, now watch this, Paul almost seems to suggest that perhaps we are called... Because we are the most broken, the worst suited, the most in need of divine intervention and spiritual growth. Listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 27 through 28. But God had chosen the foolish things. Okay. Let's break this down because I want to be sure we've got it. Who does foolish things? Fools. That's who does foolish stuff, fools. So if God has chosen the foolish things, he has chosen the fool of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things. Who does weak things? Weaklings. So God has chosen the weaklings of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised. God has chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. One more, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. That no flesh, verse 29, should glory in his presence. This is why that any individual, no matter how greatly they are used of God, has flaws. And some of them have great flaws. The reformer Martin Luther was a raging violent anti-Semite. In all fairness, I must point out that almost everyone was anti-Semite in that period of history. The Catholic Church had used the role of the Jews in the crucifixion of Christ to lower their value to that even below an animal. They had taught that Jews deserved violence and hate because they rejected and crucified Jesus. In his work, Luther wrote, the work's title is The Jews and Their Lies in 1543, and this is what he wrote. I advise that you set fire to their synagogues or schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or a cinder of them. I advise, said Luther, that their houses be razed and destroyed. I advise, said Luther, that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatry lies, cursing, and blasphemies are taught be taken from them. I advise, wrote Luther, that their rabbis be forbidden to teach on the pain of loss of life and limb. I advise, Luther wrote, that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews. I advise, he wrote further, that usury be prohibited to them and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken away from them and put aside for safekeeping. And there is much, much more to be quoted in that same line and sentiment of rave and rant against the Jews. But what shall we say? Shall we say that Luther was not called of God? Shall we say that he did not labor with God to break the yoke of Catholic idolatry and religious darkness? No. We must face the fact that Luther was greatly flawed, even sinful, and yet he was used of God. 
Now, lest some of you think that I'm making an allowance for which the Scripture does not, let me remind you of Abraham, who was most likely an idolater at the beginning like his father, and probably worshipped all the gods that his father worshipped, and it seemed like he even worshipped one additional one, which was the one true God. He was like the people on Mars Hill. He had an altar to an unknown God, but he worshipped them all. And it was in that worship of that unknown God that God began to speak to him and call him out. It was in idolatry that God first started speaking to Abraham. We know he was a liar. At least in the instance where he passed Sarah off as his sister instead of his wife in Genesis chapter 12. There is Jacob, the liar and the deceiver, who was chosen by God and called to be the father of the Israelite nation. Who who can forget Moses, the murderer turned minister? who was called of God to lead the Hebrews to the land of promise, the man who talked with God face to face. Do I need to recount Gideon and his unbelief? Or Jephthah and his rash vows? Shall I again point out the sins of Samson's or the rebellion of Saul? Shall I discuss David's adultery or Solomon's idolatry idolatry and weakness for women? Need we re-examine the falls of Peter and the violence of Paul? No! What we have established is that God calls people who are unperfect, even sinful people, people who are greatly flawed. God calls them not because of who they are, but because what he wants to make of them. And the calling is very seldom instantaneous. It is a progressive work. God called Abraham in idolatry and then fitted him for the calling. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 9, Paul writes about this, about Abraham, and he says, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? You'll remember that Abraham was uncircumcised until he was 99. This man was a late starter if there ever was one. He didn't even have the seal of the covenant that he was in a relationship with God till he was 99. But God didn't wait for him to be circumcised to call him. He called him and began a relationship and at one point he said, Okay, Abraham, it's time you are circumcised. This is how God does things. I know we as the church have gotten into this instantaneous miraculous that pops, sizzles, and snaps, and we believe that everything that God does, He does that way. But could I tell you that that is a very rare thing? It has always been that God has led His people step by step, direction by direction, a pillar of cloud by day, and a fire by night. God has always led His people. And God chooses the most broken, the most flawed, and sometimes he calls them to the most extraordinary task that one could ever imagine. Why is that? I will tell you and give you a visual of this. You remember the picture that is so popular of the good shepherd who has the little lamb on his shoulders. You know why the shepherd's carrying that lamb? It's not because he just loves him more than the rest of them, but he has a bad tendency to wander off. And the only way that the shepherd can keep him in line is by toting him on his shoulders. And I believe God has to do that for most of the people that he calls. I believe that we as believers have to be toted so much of the time on the shoulders of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone have turned to their own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul says Abraham received the faith that was reckoned to him for righteousness when he was in 
uncircumcision. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Notice this, God calls those things that are not as though they were. God called Abraham a friend when he was still nothing more than an uncircumcised idolater. He goes further, and God called Abraham a father before he ever was. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 4 and 5, and in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 16, we see where God called Abraham father before he was and Sarah mother before she conceived. Read it. He said, you'll be the father of many nations. And he said, Sarah shall have a son, shall conceive and have a son. She's going to be a mother. But she wasn't. Abraham is a father, but he isn't. The Greek word for apostle means messenger or ambassador. I want you to notice this. Paul says, I am a servant of Jesus Christ called to be a messenger. Called to take a message and deliver a message. Somebody says, well, I can't preach for an hour like y'all do. It has nothing to do with the length of the message. If I want you to go tell my wife, come on, let's go to the house. You can stand there if you want to and elaborate it on it for an hour, but it doesn't make the message any more pertinent or powerful. Preachers would do good to remember this. Somebody said that when you put a washing machine on the spin cycle, when all the water's out of the tub, it needs to stop. There's no use in keep spinning once the water's out of the tub. The, the length of the message has nothing to do with the power of the message. We are all messengers. For God's sake, start talking about the message. Upon the road to Damascus, Paul was called. But notice, he was called out. This is the beginning of any calling. First, we get called out. Oh, we don't like being called out, do we? If you come up to me and you said, I'm going to call your hand on something, I automatically know this is not going to be a great conversation. We don't like to be called out. It's uncomfortably called out. But God always begins his calling by calling us out. Remember, he called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees. He called Abraham out of idolatry. He called Abraham out from among his kindred. He called Paul out of the darkness that he was in. He called Paul out of the deception. He said to Paul in Acts chapter 4, verses, verse, Acts chapter 9, verse 4, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He called him out. The second thing was he called Paul to something and from something. This is the second two steps. And they do not always happen simultaneously. Sometimes God allows us to still dabble and function and be attached to the thing that he wants us to get loose from for a little while because he is moving us toward where we should be called to and sometimes we're reluctant to let go of what we're being called from. And God allows it for a while. Then there comes that moment that we might, we very possibly will explore next Sunday that word that follows in our text, that follows the called word, separated. I'm not going there. You can break that clot up for yourself or come next Sunday if the Lord permits me to go there. Paul was called from something, called to something. I want you to notice God has a real penchant for creating somethings out of nothings, of making somebodies out of nobodies. He makes apostles out of oppressors, saints out of sinners, disciples out of dissidents. That's what God does. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet before he was conceived. 
Our text says God calls those things that are not as though they were. David was anointed king when he was nothing but a shepherd boy. Here's the thing. God never calls the person to fit the calling. He calls us to the calling and then he says, we will work on this to make you fit the calling. And I want to suggest it's a lifelong process. I've seen a lot of good men in my time, a few good women. But almost invariably, there is still something that is being polished. This is, this is why if you hang around a person for long enough, I don't care how sanctified they are, how glorious they are, how much you respect them, if you hang around a person long enough, you're going to find something that surprises you. And it might even disappoint you. What do you do when that happens? Write the person off? Oh, they're a hypocrite. No, don't do that because... Paul writes that we who judge another also judge ourselves. God uses imperfect people because that's the only kind of people there are. So there's always something to be shaped, something to be polished, something to be molded, something to be turned. But thank God it is a process with which God engages us. The disciples walked with Jesus for three and a half years, we traditionally believe. And during that walk, you will notice there's some really rough edges. James and John decides to destroy a whole Samaritan village because they didn't accept Jesus. And if they could have, they would have called fire and lightning from heaven to do it. This is the thing about the Bible. You have these really pious people who will kill you in a heartbeat and use God to do it. Why? Because they were not perfect. Read the Psalms. You'll find where David's asking God to break cheekbones and teeth and legs and arms. And... Now, we never read anywhere where God answered the prayer, but he prayed it. We can pray a lot of stuff God doesn't answer, thankfully. Because they were men. We find Peter, he was so rough around the edges that even Jesus at times couldn't hardly take it anymore. And he would say, get behind me. Leave me alone. You are offense. That's what he said. You are an offense to me, Peter. And they walked with Jesus for these three and a half years. But as you notice, there is subtle changes. At one time, Peter would have cut the ear off of the servant of the high priest and not only cut the ear off of him, but he would have went for his head, his neck, his belly, whatever. But his rough edges, Jesus said, Peter, put up the sword. And that word from his master was enough to conquer his aggression and violence. In the past, it would not have been, I believe. Peter would have been like a dog with his nose to the ground going after a scent. You could have hollered, you could have whistled, you could have done whatever you wanted to, and Peter was going to do what Peter wanted to do. But over his time with Jesus, even though he went rogue, a word from Jesus brought him back. You see, these are subtle changes. You and I need to realize that God never leaves us to fulfill our calling on our own. When He calls us, He takes it upon Himself to fit us for that calling. And if the clay will ever allow the potter to do His work, I believe the last sermon let me say it like this. If I let God do what he wants to do in me, my last sermon will be my best one. If I let God do in me what he wants to do, my last 
few moments of life will be my most pious and dedicated ones. Because that's what God does. He fits us. He molds us. He makes us. He shapes us. And we are servants. We are called. But servanthood and callings go together. Hand in hand. A calling is not necessarily a promotion. It's an assignment. But it is an imperative assignment. When Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep, he said it three times. Feed my sheep. Peter understood exactly what Jesus was saying. And from that moment on, he took that calling. And the most unlikely one of all the apostles turned out to be the one that God used in one of the most mighty ways outside of the Apostle Paul, if you can bring a comparison in any way in the early